Um, well, let's see. Prior to the war, of course, I was in high school. And uh, I graduated in June of 42. And when my birthday came in September of 42, I went and enlisted. Uh, and that was accepted, so I got my start. My interest in aviation was just simply when I was around 12 or 13, I made a lot of airplanes. I was aware of uh, everybody that won the Thompson Trophy uh, every year and uh, made models of those planes. Uh, <clears throat> the first training we went to was right at uh, Albert Lee, Minnesota, flew the Taylor Cubs. And of course, my training was just about exactly the same as Lyle. We uh, went from Cubs to uh, uh, biplanes to SMDs for our instrument training, SNJs for everything else. And uh, now I'll write a little bit. Uh, I graduated in uh, August of 15, uh, in 1944. And it says on the sheet of paper that I got that I had completed the uh, curriculum for fighter pilot. So my birthday wasn't until April, uh, September 8th. So I was still 19. So I can say I was a teenage fighter pilot, right? <laughs> for about a month. <laughs> um, we were stationed actually in all the normal places. Um, I, graduated from Corpus Christi, we had heard then that um, they were going to start training Navy pilots to fly Corsairs. Uh, this hadn't happened up to this time. The Marines were given the Corsairs, the Navy was giving the plane called the Hellcat, which was another fighter. But uh, um, we didn't think the Hellcat was as good as the Corsair. There were six of us that kind of palled around together, and um, we wanted Corsairs. So I'm going to read a little bit. That was uh, an article in Air Classics, usually, written by a friend of mine, uh, explaining how we got Corsairs. Glasses on? A couple of us had been snooping around the personnel office and trying to find out which base was training Corsair pilots. All of us wanted to fly Corsair so bad we could taste it. One of our guys, Ralph Hume, a handsome blonde with blue eyes, found out that a girl named Beth was in charge of assigning new pilots to certain bases. She wasn't much to look at, but Ralph didn't care when he thought about the Corsair she suddenly became Betty Gribble. <laughs> we gave Ralph 50 bucks and he wined and dined her for a whole weekend. Bingo! The Corsairs were at NAS Jacksonville, a marine air station. You know what? All six of us got orders to get on a train to Jacksonville. How's that for luck? Ralph had performed above and beyond the call. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Like I said, it's in their classes. Um, so that's how I'm a green pilot flying Corsairs. Now, I don't think there were many of us because we're talking at the end of the war. Um, I, I, I followed on the Bennington a Lyle squad. So we were the replacement squad. Where he was involved in uh, kamikazes, our mission and this was um, uh, brought to us before we went overseas, was to see what destruction we could do uh, to Japan itself. We had uh, some um, strikes on Rota, a small island, and then we moved on to uh, the islands of Japan. Uh, we were called into a meeting, and an admiral said, you know what, we're changing the rules. The rules up to this time is if you are captured, all you had to do was give them your name, your serial number, and your rank. We're changing everything. If you are captured, tell them everything you know, absolutely everything you know. We would be delighted, we would be delighted if the Japanese would try to come out and bomb our air group. By that time, we had 15 carriers plus cruisers and destroyers 
there was no way that the Japanese were going to get at our carriers. In fact, the kamikazes, uh, when we were, were in uh, combat, didn't even try to get to the carriers. They were happy to get to a destroyer or someone on the outer fringes. So that was kind of unique that we were given that type of a, of a command that we should let them know everything. But that was our mission. Uh, what we did, of course, was uh, exactly the same, as, not, not exactly the same, but we strafed airfields, we strafed uh, airplanes, uh, railroad trains. Uh, the main thing was the shipping between the islands. We would put a rocket or two into a ship that, between islands so that <coughs> that would discourage them from trying to get um, something from one island to the other. We just wanted to stop all transportation. Um, we were quite successful, I think, even though we were only there for a couple months. Now, we started at the end of June, and uh, the ceasefire was August, uh, I'm not sure, who knows, 13th? And then the uh, uh, surrender was September 2nd when, uh, you know, we flew over the uh, Missouri. So, uh, just for fun, I'll put just a couple things. Uh, <clears throat> well, first of all, you may be interested in this. This is just a little diagram of our dive, dive bombing run. Now, I don't know when Lyle did dive bombing, but they put the dive brakes down. Of course, they didn't really have real dive brakes. You put the, the uh, landing gear down and leave the tail, tail uh, wheel up, and that was our friction for stopping the airplane from going too fast. We decided to dive clean, so we were diving probably at 400 knots or more. And uh, when our pullout was always six Gs, and uh, it would take probably 1,500 feet to pull out. So we would start our dive at about 16,000 or even higher. And what we did is roll upside down, go through, roll out, and then go straight down. But if you were going straight down with the airplane, the airplane itself was diving at a 70 degree angle because the wings would pull the plane forward as you were diving. So we would get about a 70 degree dive angle, which meant we had to start our dive short of the target, and we would release our bombs, and this sounds pretty high, around 5,000 feet. But the altimeter had a lag, so we were a little lower than that. And it took us about 1,500 feet to pull out at that speed, but it was still very accurate. Uh, when we went into Curry, we were diving on all the carriers and uh, the cruisers and the battleships, everything that the Japanese had was at Curry, And uh, our division dove at a cruiser. Um, and I hate to admit this, but I was flying a brand new Corsair. And when I pickled for the bomb, it didn't come off. Uh, and uh, so I didn't drop my bomb. But that means that three other people were dive bombing, two of them got direct hits, one got in their face. Now that's pretty accurate. They proved that the Corsair could dive bomb as good as the SPD Dolphins. And the SPD was designed as a dive bomber, where the Corsair was designed as a fighter. This airplane, in my estimation, and I'm sure in Lyle's estimation, was the best World War II fighter. It had a 2,000 horsepower engine, it could carry 4,000 pounds of bombs. We never did because, like Lionel said, we wouldn't have made it off the carrier. But uh, it could carry 4,000 and get off on a land strip. It was great if you had to do a water landing because you can see the wing was lower than the fuselage, so it, it would be like planing along the top of the water. So your airplane wouldn't sink immediately. You'd have plenty of time to get out. 
Uh, I like to uh, tell a little joke about uh, when we were uh, reading books, we had a book that everyone, I think in my squadron, read. It was called uh, I Fly for Vengeance. That's the title, I Fly for Vengeance. It was a Navy pilot that wrote that book. John Lundgren, one of our pilots, ditched three times. Ran out of fuel once, was uh, sh uh, shot the other time and couldn't land on the carrier. I don't even know what the third one was, but he landed in the water three times, was picked up by a destroyer. So you guess what we started calling him? John, I swim for vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we were divided into 48, we had 48 pilots, uh, 24 were ensigns. So half of us were ensigns, and we were, each of us, assigned an airplane that we had to, you know, look over. If you were a, a junior, lieutenant or a full lieutenant, you, know, you didn't have to do that. And uh, what they kept saying was, uh, God must love the ensigns because he made so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> now, we mentioned Hawaii, and what a great time we had in Hawaii, Hawaii when we traveled there. Uh, you probably don't know that in World War II, more pilots were killed in training than were killed in combat. Did you know that? More pilots in training than in combat. Maui had volcanoes on both sides of it, and there were accidents. So a little statement that came up was, uh, here, uh, uh, here today, gone to Maui. <laughs> um, oh, should I tell them about the, you said you flew the F4F. The F4F, you had to crank the wheels up and down. How many times? 26. 26 times you had a crank to get the wheels done. Well, one thing that, that we always said that there are two types of pilots. The pilots that have landed with the wheels up and the pilots that are going to land with the wheels up. And the one of uh, F4F came in at our base once when he had forgotten to put the wheels down. So we skidded across the runway, hit the, the grass, flipped upside down. Everybody thought, oh my God, I hope he's not dead. And they went rushing out with the ambulance, and as they approached the airplane, they could see the wheels come up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it would be nice if we could do something like that. Make it work well, right? <laughs> uh, uh, now, let's see, I want to uh, tell you, uh, um, Lyle, of course, was involved in shooting up the kamikaze, so he did such a great job, there weren't any left when we got there. We were attacked by a kamikaze uh, only once, and it was shot down in its dive by someone from another carrier. Uh, we also once had an attack by kamikazes, and I don't know uh, what they were trying to do, but that's the only time I flew a Corsair for over six hours. Have you flown a Corsair for over six hours? It was because they told us not to come in. They were under attack by kamikazes. And we had to circle around until it was safe to come in. Um, I know you, you shot down, uh, your squadron shot down a lot of airplanes. Uh, we only shot down five. Uh, I never even saw a Japanese plane in the air to tell the truth. But um, that was not our job. Like I said, our job was to go over the islands and uh, try to destroy what we could. Here's what we did destroy though. Which for just a couple months of action is a lot, I think. Uh, in shipping, four direct hits on a battleship, two direct hits on a carrier, two direct hits on another carrier, one direct hit on the cruiser, three uh, uh, destroyer escorts, a small destroyer, a small cargo ship, oiler, gunboat, sub chaser, 20 small cargo ships, 20 small craft, railroad engines destroyed 11, oil and gas dumps 3, ammunition dumps 1, shops 15, um, destroyer escorts sunk 2, one prowler sunk, one large cargo ship, one smaller, two luggers, eight small cargo ships, 16 small crafts, all, all that destroyed in just a couple of months. 
So we were very, very effective. But obviously, we were flying one of the best planes in the world, and obviously, uh, you know, our training had been very, very uh, well. So um, I, uh, I guess that, that shows you, and I'm sure your squadron probably even maybe duplicated what that was. Uh, let's see if I have anything else to say. I guess, outside of the fact that, uh, oh yeah, uh, we, we did have two cases where our pilots were attacked by Japanese fighters. Uh, in one case, three of our pilots were shot down. The other case, two of our pilots were shot down. Now you may wonder why the Japanese were shooting down American planes. That's simply because they would wait high while we made a dive bombing run, and on our recovery, they'd come down on us. And there was no way to defend against it. Absolutely no way. Uh, there, we had Applegate shot down, and he was, uh, 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 well, that's what I said, he parachuted and was a uh, submarine, had picked him up for the following day. But we uh, feel he shot down uh, a Japanese pilot called Muto, M-U-T-O. And he was considered the toughest fighter pilot in the Imperial Navy. Uh, that was written in a book called Pacific Air Combat World War II. So we did have some engagement with Japanese pilots. The Japanese pilots that were still alive by then had a lot of experience. They were great, and obviously we didn't have as much experience as they did. The kamikaze pilots were different. They were badly trained, hardly knew how to take off their airplane, and, uh, and uh, I guess uh, most of them uh, just sacrificed their lives. I think there's one, one uh, story about a uh, Kamikaze pilot that had 10 missions. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that kind of shows you what our experience was. We just followed Lyle, uh, we replaced them, and continued until the war was over. Oh, one more thing. Uh, uh, do I have one? Oh, yeah. One more thing. Uh, one more thing. Uh, the Admiral was aboard our ship, and we uh, then had the priority on everything. As an example, when we did the flyover over the Missouri, our squadron was the lead squadron. Now, have you ever seen the, the plane flying over and you want to count up to number 12? That's me. The other thing is the Admiral wanted a group of four to fly over Japan to see if they'd be shot at. And guess who was one of the four? I was. I remember going to Japan and thinking, my God, I could be the last American killed in World War II. But it didn't happen. Uh, and matter of fact, the uh, division leader, Clyde, and his wingman, Jones, actually went down and touched down on an on a airstrip. Just a touchdown, you know, uh, what they call a, what do they call it? Touch, touch and go. So I witnessed, I think, the first two airplanes that actually, in peace, touched down in Japan right, a couple days after the ceasefire. And, and that was uh, an experience, too. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next part of the program is very interesting because it's something that most people don't know anything about. Uh, Elizabeth Stolkos, like I said, is from my hometown in Fairville, Minnesota, and she was one of the women that were brought in during World War II, and to alleviate uh, the men that were going off to combat, they had these women uh, bring in the aircraft from the factories to various bases, and uh, Liz got involved in this, and uh, she's going to talk about it now. Uh, we're probably going to run about 10 minutes over, and uh, the reason why is because uh, this has been a very interesting session so far, and I, didn't, I haven't seen anybody leave. So at this point, I'll uh, introduce uh, Liz Stokos to you, and she can tell us uh, her experiences in flying. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'll try not to make mine too long, because I'm just an old World War II pilot. But these people and people like them, they are my heroes. 
and I thank each and every one of them for what they've done for our country. God bless them all. Minnesota. I was in Minnesota and we had five, five girls and one boy in our family. It was a wonderful family. Our mother and our father were older than most parents, but they were so wonderful. And you know, we did what our mother told us and father told us to do. We didn't say why or we can't or whatever. We did what we were told. It's a little different today. I, I told my kids to knock something out to do something and they went ahead and did it anyway. <laughs> Anyway, that's what's did. So I was working as, in the courthouse as the deputy register of deeds for Al Heine. And I, uh, a fellow came up to file some papers one day, and he started talking about flying. And I, I'm a kid who always liked to climb, set me up a tree or a pole or whatever, or sit on a rope just to get up in the air. So when he started talking about flying, Oh, I thought, just think I could get a bum at all and see this beautiful world of ours. So he said, you want to ride? Sure, I want to ride. So he brought me out to the local, local airport, and this fellow, God bless him, he used to give people flights who wanted to find out about flying. So we went up, 4,500 feet into a stall, into a stand, he turned around, looked at me, and I said, one more time. And after 10 one more times, he didn't look around anymore. He landed in that airplane. <laughs> he looked a little green. And he said, you know, whatever you do, you're going to have to fly an airplane. Every person I've done that to, I've been sick. You're the only one that's made me sick. <laughs> so I knew I had to start flying. Well, there were 15 fellows there in the field, and they had this little sky club. We had a 65 horsepower club. I thought it was the greatest thing I ever saw, a little piper. And so um, I would go out do a little slide every day, took a while as much as I could. Well then, this fellow said, you know, this one fellow was going into the Air Force, now I could join their club to make the 15th person. I said, oh great, what does it cost? 100 bucks, 100 bucks. I was making 50 bucks a month, I gave Mother, 45 bucks. I had five bucks to spend. I had three older sisters. I ate at home. I slept at home. What did I need me more money for? But when I found them out flying, I knew I had to fly airplanes. So I heard the banks loan money. I went down my bicycle and I said, I said, Mr. Cowell, I want to borrow a hundred dollars. hundred dollars, Miss Wall. What do you want to do with that much money? Oh, I want to join the Sky Club. Oh, he said, what are those fun? I said, this one's going to. <laughs> and so, well, you know what? That, God bless that Mr. Cowell. He went and got the papers for me to sign. I signed the papers. He called, he took my, my bicycle for collateral, and he goes <laughs> on my note. <laughs> Boy, I like that beggar. Find a beggar like that today, and you found somebody. That was, and that was how I got my hundred dollars. So I went back out to the field and I started flying. Oh, it was wonderful. I, I just loved to fly, air, fly an airplane. And so, anyway, then I heard about the Women Pilots Organization and they want women to fly military aircraft. I thought, boy, that's what I want to do. So I, we had to go get a, a, a uh, up to the, up to the, uh, up to, well, I was up to the hospital there in the cities. We had to go ahead and get an examination to be sure that we had all our equipment. And then we had to, we had to have the, someone from, uh, from Texas, Sweetwater, Texas, come and interview us. They wanted to be sure we were of sound mind. And so being that I passed all those things, I went to Texas. <laughs> Sweetwater, Texas is where I trained. And the Texas people were just wonderful. I loved them all. And we had, and we had four good, three good square meals a day. I mean, I tell you, we had chicken and dumplings on Sunday. And oh, I tell you, we had a good, good food. 
And so, uh, well, you're all back home. Heck, you ate what you got. They didn't say, I don't like this, I don't like that. You ate what you got because there wasn't anything else to eat. <laughs> anyway, so I went down to Texas and this, oh, it was a wonderful place. I met all these wonderful ladies. And some were stars, oh, Broadway stars, and some were, were actors, actresses, and there were all kinds of beautiful women there. And there were a lot of, lot of people just like me, just, just an office worker. And you see, I had never had the chance to go to high school. I mean, I went to go to college after high school. Whoever heard of girls going to college back then? <laughs> and we had five of us, and I was, a, I was a fourth in line, so there was no way that I was going to get to high school. I mean, to, to college. Anyway, I passed all their tests, and so I, I just had a wonderful time. We started with the little primary trainer, PT-19, Fairchild, low wing and open cockpit. Oh, it was just wonderful. So we had our six months training in that, and then we went to AT, BT-13. That was a basic trainer, and we, were, we didn't know if we were going to be ferrying airplanes or training. So we had the, uh, the B-7, the B-15, we did a lot of cross-country in. And you know, I love those days of flying. You got lost, you just went, followed a railroad track in the town, find out where you are, look at the map, I look at the map and say, oh, there I am. And so then I just turn around and go back to where I'm going. <laughs> it was a wonderful time to fly. There were no, there weren't the restrictions there were today, but, but of course there weren't the many pilots as there were today either. But it was a wonderful time to fly. I just had such a good time. Anyway, then for my basic, I was going into AT6s, which was our, our advanced flying. And so, well that, between that time, I had a young man come, home, come from Fairwell. He was a flying farmer. I can tell his name now because the poor man passed away. His name was Ambrose Mariska. He was a wonderful pilot and he was a, he was a farmer and he had his own plane. He came down and he said, now you saw you were flying those airplanes, now you come home and get married. Well, I wasn't sure I wanted to get married. <laughs> I wanted to fly an airplane. But he talked for two days, ah, oh, well, he's got an airplane, I suppose I can go home and get married. So I went to my, my, my CEO and I said, Miss Steaton, I'm going to resign. You're going to resign, Betty? She said, why? She looked at my record. She said, well, you are fast in your ground school. Boy, that was tough. A lot of the other girls that had college, so they knew all about things. Physics, I thought that was something you took for a stomach ache. I thought something you had to learn to fly airplane. But anyway, that's the way it was. So. She said, well, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. But before you sign this paper, I want you to have a flight net exit, oops, 86. And so I had a flight net 86. I got off that plane. I went to the phone. I'm sorry, I'm not coming home. <laughs> he said, if you don't come home, I'm going to go home marry somebody else. I said, you go right ahead. And we both lived happily ever after. <laughs> I went to Las Vegas Army Airfield to train gunners. You see, we had the training command, oh my kid. And well, I was gonna tell you all the things we did. We flew all the tra all the ferrying in our country done at that time during the year 1944, because all of our boys were in the service. We were only in the service because so many pilots were not here for us to, for them to do the training and the ferrying in our country. Well, that was okay, but uh, anyway, that's that's the way it was. So, uh, oh, after we got out of out of Sweetwater, Texas, with my wing, I was scheduled. I went to Las Vegas Army Airfield, and I was tra I trained gunners. Oh, that was great. We had three BC B seventeens come down below, and we'd be up there with diving in at them. Thank God they shot at us with camera guns. And so uh, then also I flew the coat by the B-26 and we had a great big tow rope behind that and then a great big like a windsock in the, the back of that. And 
the fellas, the pilots, were putting their guns into different paint so they had red and yellow and blue and white and whatever. And so they could always tell which pilot had the best shot because that's how many holes they had in the, in the, <laughs> the shooter, I mean, in the, this, this uh, what do you call that thing in the back? Anyway, what? Oh yeah, that was a sleeve. Anyway, and so they they did very well, and I was I was loving that 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 film because it, it was such a great thing to do. Well, I don't tell you about that, but they better not. Anyway, <laughs> one, one time they asked me. You see, we had all these women and. Then I used to fly, I was also a pilot, a co-pilot of B-17. And that was fun, and I enjoyed that very much. Oh, except the fellows didn't want me to fly B-17. The first time I took a flight, you know what they did? All oh, they sent the electronics are out to go to wheel down the, wheel down the wheels. Oh, I almost broke my back, but by them I did it. <laughs> so anyway, I, it, was, it was just such a wonderful time. I, I really did enjoy that time with the service. And then December 20th, 1944, they wrote us a little note, said, thank you girls very much for doing such a good job. Now you can go home and lead a normal life. Well, thanks a lot. I'm the home <laughs> fly piece a PT-19. The third job says you might more park up. Heck, the B-17, four engines with 150 horsepower in each one of those engines. But that's all right, because that's the way it was. And so then over it was kind of tough. I want to tell you, though, for 35 years, they locked our, they sealed our records. Nobody knew the pilots during World War II, a woman pilot. Oh, I had a good time a couple of times, because I, I had a beautiful jacket with a B-17 on the back. And they said, oh, your husband was a B-17 pilot. I said, no, I was. <laughs> they said, you're lying. There were not women flying. Well, I said, you know, I don't care what you believe, but I did fly the B-17 as co-pilot. B-26 as co-pilot. And then they had a little fighter plane there called the P-39, the Bell Air Cobra. Oh, was that a fun aircraft to fly. One time they needed somebody to fly the B-29, B-29 and there wasn't anybody else around. I'd always stand there and wait for Somebody else thought to be there, because then they let me fly. So, <laughs> there was a P-39, he says, well, we need somebody to fly a P-39. I said, I could fly a P-39. Now, we had no simulators those years. If you wanted to fly an airplane, you got in. You, you, you did everything you're supposed to do. I mean, you read all your things you're supposed to do. And then you take the plane up, and you do what you think you're supposed to do, because you have had no training. I, oh, when I flew the P-39, I did all kinds of acrobatics. I wasn't supposed to do a P-39. But he told me I couldn't. <laughs> so it was a wonderful time for us to fly. And I appreciated every, every thing that I did in the service. It was great. And well, afterwards, I, I, I don't tell you about all the jobs I tried to get because nobody wanted to know. I was young. I mean, I couldn't say, oh, woman pilot. I was a young woman pilot. And I had a commercial rating, I had a safe plane rating, I had a foreign engine rating. Yeah, I could fly anything they had. So I worked at Firestone Rubber Company for a while, and then there was going to be an air race. So I went in and I said, Mr. Firestone, if you want to win that race, you get the airplane and I'll fly the airplane and I'll win the race for you. <laughs> oh, I tell you, I had a big ego. We have the plane and we have the, pilot, and the main pilot. We don't need you. Well, I didn't stay at work in there very long. So I did all kinds of jobs. Then I came home and got married and had five wonderful children. God bless my husband. He died at the age of 50. And I had two, two of them were in college, one was in the service, and the other two were still in high school. They had an academy. Boy. And I didn't have any money. I was working in the courthouse for peanuts. You know, women, well, women don't years just didn't, you just didn't make the money that the men did. Well, I'll tell you, the best thing that ever happened to me, I lost an election. And that was the best thing that ever happened to me. I was going to, my 
my uh, oh dear, that was a sad time. My sister, our sister Mary, was having cancer. She was so bad, and I, I lost my husband, so I lost that that income from him, and I really needed money to put the kids through school and do what I wanted to do with the kids. So anyway, I thought, well, I could run for registering teaching and then I'll get the money. Somebody else may. Of course, they told me that, well, now, don't plan on getting the same amount of money that the, that the one before did because you're a woman. I said, you know, they'll have, they'll have to have a good reason not to give me the same amount of money because I'm going to make a big stink. Well, anyway, maybe that's why they didn't vote me in. Anyway, <laughs> they voted me out. And do you know, they had trouble with that guy that was down there, but that's okay. That was their problem. <laughs> During that time, I had a pet and a mic in Boston, and they weren't calling their mother to let them know how they were doing. I was worried sick about them. So I had to, I, I had a friend of mine, a very new tumor, and she said, let's go out and check up on the boys. But when I checked on the boys, the boys were doing fine. They lived in the big, the big apartment, and they had the basement. There were pipes all over the basement, but I thought, hey, they take care of the apartment, they get their rent free, and they go out and they do different jobs. So I thought, thank God at least they're, they're getting along okay. And then I stopped at the Cancer Society office. I was a volunteer for 15 years doing a research study. It was cancer prevention study. And so I, I went to see about the, the program that I did to see how, how it was coming along. And my friend Mary Lou went in and talked to the boss, the epidemiologist, that took me a while to learn that word. And so he said, she told him that I did a pilot where we're too full all these plays. He said, I don't care what it takes, I want to get that woman on my staff. Yeah. My golly, of course they didn't tell me that until two years later. But I'd already get some money, but that's all right. I was so fortunate. I worked out of New York. I had 26 states I went to. They gave me a car and I just put my car through and I went anywhere I wanted. I ate anything long, of course, it wasn't a big eater, but anyway, I just had a wonderful time at meeting all these people in these 26 states, so it was just wonderful. So I was there for a while, then I, this was after my husband died. Ten, ten years later, I went over and I got married again. And he didn't last too long, God bless him. <laughs> Five years later, after he died, I married another guy because he was a good dancer. <laughs> well, then that, he didn't last very long. <laughs> well, then I don't know, I feel really bad because I would have seen he with the first one at the end of And they all passed away. And so I, I've been having such a good time though. I've been, I've been asked to be many places. I was, I was invited out to the, the gathering of the Eagles on the actual Air Force Base, uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Here they choose eight people, eight aviators from all over the world to be on their program. Heck, they had George, George Bush there. They, excuse me. <laughs> all the big shots, astronauts. And, I did my gut back in my pad where he could tell you all the people. I forgot who they all were, but they were all very important people. And then they had me. <laughs> they gave me a great big medal like that. It was just wonderful. The gathering of the eagles and sat my name on the back. It was just wonderful. And then they inducted me into the Aviation Hall of Fame in the state of Minnesota. That was nice. Last year I was. I was Veteran Woman of the Year, my, that was something. And so I thanked them very much. And so I've been having lots of programs and lots of fun, and I love to tell my story. What is, one more story, can I tell one more story? <laughs> <laughs> okay, when I was, um, uh, this girl that had me go on programs with her, she said she wanted me to give programs about my organization, because you know, nobody knew about it. There was nothing in the books about the Women's Air Force. And so I said, gee, I'm no public speaker. She's only got to do is tell your job, tell your, your story. And so anyway, she and I were at the CAF uh, air show one day, and there was a beautiful F-16 sitting all down the ramp. 
and Eugene Andriani is the adjutant general of the Air National Guard. He came up and he said, Say, he said, have you ever flown an F-16? I said, nobody would ever be let me near an F-16. You would. Would you like to fly an F-16? I said, sure. <laughs> so, now there again, I had no information. I had no, no, uh, you know, time in the end simulator, but say, I sure, I'll fly it. So, I didn't hear from him for two weeks. He had to call the Pentagon. He had to get permission because at that time there were no women pilots flying the F-16. This was a 91. And so I didn't hear from two weeks. Ah, they forgot about me. I got a call saying, I got permission for you to fly the F-16. When do you want to go? I said, tomorrow. I don't want to stick around. <laughs> so, come so anyway, I went up to Duluth and all oh, they fixed me out and all their equipment. They had a, a doctor come and talk to me to see if I, I think to see if I was mentally okay. <laughs> and anyway, he looked through over me. He said, no, there's nothing wrong with her. She can go fly an F-16. So I went and flying an F-16. Oh, was that fun. We went up to Duluth and they fit me in their outfit that had to be all flame resistant to in case we catch fire. Catch fire. And so he, he went out and oh, he did all these maneuvers. You know, I do all these crazy maneuvers and I never been sick in an airplane. I've mundane nothing in the head to get sick about, I don't know. But anyway, so I, he got me all ready with the helmet and the thing and the, G-suits on. Oh, it was great. So we got in the airplane and we went up. He did lots of acrobatics. Oh, it was wonderful. He did some uh, cruise along with another airplane. And then he put his hands. Now, see, i would never been on a simulator. My sticks move like this. Their sticks move like that. So he put his hands up here and he says, okay, you're in control. I said, okay. I said, I'll do a gentle turn. <laughs> Six cheese, just like that. <laughs> you know, pants here blew up like a balloon. <laughs> and he got on the stick and he should say, take it easy, I don't have the brown bag. Oh, I said, honey, you gonna have mine? Because I don't need it. <laughs> but the Air National Guard were very gracious to me and I am very appreciative of what they do for me. I have had so many honors. I tell you, it's almost embarrassing because, you know, I'm just an old lady pilot. These fellas are the ones who won the war for us. And I'm proud of all the things that they've done. God bless them all, and God bless you all. God bless you all.